So I'm not who you think I am, not exactly who you think I am. I've got many different personalities. Now, I know that answers a lot of questions, right? <laughs> so I have a personality for every aspect of my life. My work personality is very different from home. You can ask Gary. Common ground personality is distinct from work. And I even have different personalities for some of my friends. Now, all these personalities have similarities. I am basically the same person. And yet, it's very difficult, sorry. It's very difficult when you have multiple personalities to keep them all straight. Now, I'm not talking about people that have multiple personality disorders. That will leave to the psychologist. I'm talking about in our everyday lives. And the reason this struck me is we as a people, we have a tendency to adapt who we are to where we are, the situation that we're with. People, we tend to agree with things that we have no opinion of simply because we want to be part of a group. We sometimes keep our thoughts and our opinions silent because of the group that we are with. So we're constantly editing and we're being chameleons and humans are the best chameleons in the world. And if you don't believe me, look at the fashions over the last couple decades. Everybody wants to be unique. Everybody wants to be unique from clothing to hairstyles. And yet you look around and what you see is everybody being unique by doing what everybody else is doing. Okay. <clears throat> so how long, how often in your life have you found yourself denying a belief you held strongly simply because somebody else disagreed with it? You kept silent. And we're talking about any beliefs. We're not just saying spiritual. We all have a wide range of thoughts, ideas, and opinions on everything. And more often than not, we have opinions on things that we know nothing about. So it's the spiritual discovery. In, in, in the spiritual world, self-discovery is one of the things that we all strive to do. It's to understand ourselves. In my life, I've attended some very fantastic seminars and classes, all the way from North Carolina to Guatemala, Nevada, California, and Arizona. And no matter where I have gone, and no matter how great the class is, I always find a handful, and at times a room full, of students who profess to have shed themselves of all of the perceived negative aspects of their life. In essence, they are now perfect. They don't get mad. They never lie. They no longer worry about what others think of them. They have divested themselves of all attachments and never have a negative thought. To listen to these people, one would assume that the sun is always shining, it's always warm, and there is no other car no other car ever to be found on the 91 freeway when they are commuting. <laughs> In short, I have met hundreds of people who have eradicated their dark side and they shine so brightly they no longer have a shadow. But that's not realistic. We do not cure ourselves of the personality traits we prefer others not to see or know about. And we certainly are not able to hide them forever. Our shadow side and personalities are a part of us. Ignoring these does not diminish their presence in our lives. Indeed, we may be surprised when these characteristics pop up unexpectedly. Here's something I know to be true. I, I know it as sure as I'm standing here right now. Each of us has the capacity within to hurt another, to be dishonest with another. We each are capable of anger, greed, and envy. Now, we're not called to deny these aspects of ourselves. Rather, we are called to recognize and question these feelings or actions, not merely react and express them. That 
is the difference here. Each of these emotions has much to teach us. Each of these expressions, depending on the intensity, can shed light on who we are, why we react to what we do, and how we take that energy, refocus it, and bring about a change either on a personal level or a spiritual level. Anger is not a place we want to stay. However, if you are self-aware enough, anger can be a tool. The first thing we need to do is understand why we are angry. Seems easy, right? Not always. Sometimes our anger is so sudden, even we are surprised by the outburst. Other times, so caught up in the moment that we simply go with the anger and perhaps later regret our actions or words. But if we take a moment to truly understand why we got angry, rarely is anger just anger. It stems from hurt, fear, doubt, and confusion. In that moment, or as soon as possible, we are called to question what was it about the situation that caused us to experience that sudden fear? What were we confused about? What is the root cause of the hurt? Man, and I do mean this in the generalist of terms, is a master at pushing buttons. Those buttons that are pushed bring back painful emotional memories, things we have not released or forgiven. The present and past don't even have to be connected or remotely similar for those buttons to be pushed. On a subconscious level, there is something about that one button that someone just pushed that sends you into immediate defense mode. Now on the other hand, righteous anger also has a place. When the actions that follow bring about social change and justice, without the desire to create and change, without the desire to create a change and action to follow it up, righteous anger does not exist. Changes around the world have always been marked by righteous anger, which shed light on a social injustice. And from this came the peaceful but forceful calls for change. And unfortunately, even at times, less than peaceful demonstrations, which ultimately brought about change to society that freed so many who had been oppressed. And yet, even those who are no longer oppressed have a memory of when they were. And buttons can be pushed today that remind us of where we were and our need to continue the march forward. Envy and jealousy, when fully understood on an individual basis, can be a catalyst to working for something. Yet again, we are called to question these feelings. Why am I jealous when my best friend tells me he just got a great job? I'm a good person. And of course I want the best for him, right? We all believe that about ourselves. So I have to question, am I jealous because I want to be better than he is? And if so, that might be something I need to work on. The other way to look at it is, did he get a job that I wanted? What are my qualifications? Do my qualifications fit for that particular job? And if they don't, that envy for his job, that jealousy that was sparked, causes me to look at how I can improve my qualifications. Are we both qualified the same way? What's he doing that's different than I'm doing, and what can I learn from it so that I can grow along with him? That momentary second where you become jealous of somebody's successes or what they are gaining allows you to look at your life and determine why. Why do I feel that way? Because not, none of us want to admit that you know, we're better than anybody else, because we all in this room know we're not. And yet, those thoughts of jealousy will kick in. The fact of the matter is, regardless of what negative emotions we might feel at the moment, or moments, we have a choice. 
We can live in those spaces and watch as chaos reigns supreme, or we can look within. By not denying the whole of who and what we are, we can begin to use those emotions as tools to enlighten our lives. Help us grow and ultimately, truly heal old wounds. Forgive past mistakes, ours as well as others, and truly embrace the oneness within. To illustrate my point, I have a story to share. This story is about a young boy who was a master of hiding in plain sight. He could be anything and everything anyone needed him to be, and most people thought he was a happy boy. Few could imagine the world he was living within his own mind. This was a very self-aware boy. He knew what he was doing. He knew how to play the game so that most people left him alone, while never actually realizing that he was manipulating them rather than them manipulating him as they believed. As this boy became older, hiding became harder. The effort it took to be everything to everyone, the skill it took to craft the hundreds of cover stories, and the daily chore of remembering everything that he told everyone so as not to get his stories crossed and thus blow his cover became a weight so heavy that he finally could no longer do it. One day he snapped. He'd had enough. And so he completely reinvented himself. He was no longer the same person. All the things he had not liked about himself, he put in a box, sealed it off, and moved on. New name, new life. That person he had been was no more and could no longer create the havoc that had dominated his life for so long. He'd taken the advice of one self-help book too many to the extreme. Mm -hmm. Yet, he could say that he was no longer that person. So out of curiosity, by a show of hands, who here believes he was successful in ridding himself of what he called his shadow side? <laughs> that little boy was me. And when I say I reinvented myself, I mean that in the most literal way. Before the reinvention, I was known by one name, and after, by the name you know me as today. But things didn't get better. In my rush to be me, I lost sight of who I wanted to be. I became much more angry <coughs> than I'd ever been. I was vengeful, hurtful, and above all, I was determined to hurt others before they could hurt me. Now, I managed to suppress some of the characteristics that I didn't like about myself, but there were others that I ignored, and in turn, these were amplified. I had always had anger issues, but I never learned how to adequately control them. And so when this reinvention was complete, the anger that I had learned to suppress now became my shield and my weapon for self-preservation. I had spent so many years trying to be something I wasn't, lying about so much of who I was and how I felt, that even in my desire to no longer be that little boy anymore, I created a much older, meaner, and dare I say, more bitter version of who I'd pretended to be before. The fear and anger that fueled this transformation only changed its manifestation and I was more unhappy than I had been before, though I no longer recognized how unhappy I was. <laughs> I basically thought I was surviving and extremely happy. Now this phase lasted longer than I'd like to admit, and in the process I hurt more people than I would ever even know how to count. Fortunately, during my youth, I'd kept very good journals. And it was in these journals that I would express my true feelings and also keep track of the lies and stories I'd created. Because of these journals, I was able to separate fact and fiction from my own memories and start to understand myself better. I started to react differently 
when my buttons were pushed and over time have become the man you see today. Now, I am not perfect. You only have to ask Gary. I lose my temper more often than I would like, just not for as long as I once did. I do not deny what I am capable of, nor do I excuse it. I don't say, hey, this is me, so deal with it. Instead, I am willing to try and react differently. And when that's not possible, I at least try to catch myself and redirect the emotions to understand the root. Now, sometimes I can do it in a moment. Sometimes it takes a few days and other times a few months. We all have our own timelines. When I was a very little boy, my mother gave me a book titled The Little Me and the Great Me. I love this book. I still have this book. I think it's a wonderful lesson on recognizing when we are not kind and when we lash out at others and to remember we can be led by fear or we can lead with love. To love myself and to lead with an open heart, I cannot deny nor ignore my shadow side, my darker emotions. For in ignoring them and pretending they don't exist, I will not be able to recognize when the little me presents himself. Remember, anger attracts anger, fear attracts fear. And so the best way to move above the anger and fear is to recognize where it's coming from, understand it, position it, and redirect that energy in some loving form, whatever form that takes. Now recently, I was provided the opportunity to experience one of those tests that life just loves to give us. Now I know I created these lessons. I know I attracted the opportunities. Yet I think we can all agree, when faced with it, it's never fun to experience or hear. Someone very close to me hurt and betrayed me. And so strong was the relationship we had that I was blindsided and never saw it coming. I never expected it. And I was devastated far more than I would have ever imagined possible. Today, I don't believe it was an intentional betrayal. In fact, I, if I'm to be honest, I believe it was an act of self-preservation on their part. But I immediately went to a place of anger. No, anger is not the right word. It was rage. The green monster of revenge came front and center. My entire body trembled from the desire to destroy this person and all others involved. Immediately, the little me came forward with precisely what could be done and should be done. Now, I was shocked by this rage. I hadn't experienced it in a very long time. And I was so shocked by it that it stopped me cold. This was not who I wanted to be. I know my shadow side. I know what I'm capable of. And I choose not to express that. But I don't deny it. And it was through this recognition of what I could be and what I wanted to be that allowed me, within a very short amount of time, to decide how I would react. I'm pretty proud of myself. Within 30 minutes, I was willing, underline the word willing, to forgive. I hadn't gotten there yet. And it was through this recognition, sorry. Now, I do admit that I moved back and forth with the forgiveness for some time. The anger returned and just as quickly dissipated. Each time a little less, and each time the willingness to forgive became closer. The person is still very dear to me, and forgiveness did finally come. The betrayal is not forgotten, and I'm no longer as naive as I once was when it came to them. But I chose the relationship and the love over my anger and revenge, and I believe both of our lives were better for it. And that is but one example of how embracing, acknowledging, 
and understanding your shadow can lead to strength and spiritual growth. I know this to be true for me. I know when I take the time to understand why I feel the way I do about something, things become clear. And forgiveness does begin its process. Until I understand my shadow reaction, I find it hard to see the light and begin the process of being willing to forgive. So as always, it has been a pleasure to share my journey with you. In closing, I challenge you to look within, to learn to understand your shadow side, become acquainted, and when presented with the opportunity, question the root cause of your reaction. One way you can do this is by writing yourself a letter. And this letter should be titled, How I Would Like to Be Remembered. Now this is not about what others think of you or even what you think of yourself. It's simply writing a letter that details how you would like to be remembered and how that would look. For example, you might say you want to be remembered as being kind. We all say that we would like to be remembered as being kind, but what does that look like to you? How do you want your life to manifest so that people remember you as being kind? Once you write the letter with all the things that you want to be remembered as, set the letter aside and reread it a few days or even a few weeks later and see what insights you find. And maybe think about what you can do to bring those qualities and aspects into your life. Have a blessed week, and remember to be kind to yourself as well as others. Peace be with you. Shalom. Namaste.